Amen. Amen. Be seated. Glad to have you back with us again tonight. Miss Jennifer is uh, under the weather, and Miss Teresa tried to make it. Uh, she wants to start playing the piano again. And I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. That uh, when when they told me, uh, hey, Miss uh, Miss Teresa wants to, she said today that she wanted to play the piano. Uh, that's that's uh, that that's growth. And that's, that's a great, great thing, and I'm glad to hear that. Uh, just what I wanted to say is we had 25-plus um, uh, uh, people saved last week. Let's praise the Lord for that. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Amen. Now, the world's still getting worse, but God still saves. Amen. God still saves. Uh, November 11th, Veterans Day, no school. Uh, November 22nd through the 25th, Thanksgiving break for them. And then uh, November 27th, junior, junior and Youth Activity to the Festival of Trees. Uh, Miss Sarah will be heading that up. Uh, let's see. Featured Sermon of the Month is Slip, Slide, Fall. Slip, Slide, Fall. That was uh, preached in uh, June, July of uh, 2002 by Pastor Doug Jackson. Get yourself a copy of that if you don't have it. And what I'd like to do is, is, is uh, put all of our stuff on like downloadable or um, stream. Uh, but that's all. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, uh, thousands of sermons that are in there, and that would be a, that that'd be a, a labor right there. So um, maybe in the future. But um, uh, these uh, the principles for life, I've stick it in my Bible, keep it in my Bible, and uh, the Bible is the Word of God. Jesus is the Son of God. I won't quit. I can makes a great man. Work to eat. Have pity on the poor. Pay your bills. Do right till the stars fall. Uh, be a loyal friend. It's never right to do wrong to make it right. Uh, the preacher is the man of God. The church is the house of God. I am the child of God, and heaven is the home of God. I don't know where those ones came from, but I like them. Uh, so uh, live by principles. Live by principles. I have a that, that series that I started some time ago about living by principles. I will continue that. But in the meantime, um, I want you to open up to the book of John. John, John, the epistle, the, the, the uh, gospel of John. John chapter 15. John 15. You're all good. Hey, thanks for trying. It's all good. Totally. All right. Thank you. Uh, John 15. Jesus said uh, in uh, verses 1 through 11, he said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. This is Jesus speaking. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Heavenly Father, help us to have full joy, real joy, continuing joy. Uh, Christians have got to be the most joyful people on earth uh, because of the promises as we sang this morning. And, uh, and, and it doesn't mean that we are exempt from heartaches and trials and testings and tribulations and uh, problems and heaviness. It just means we have a way out. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to be joyful people. Help our church. And put a smile on people's faces, like I said this morning, that this place becomes a, 
becomes a place of uh, rest and an oasis against the world. And uh, Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you would um, uh, help us this evening. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if the pastor forgot to turn his phone off, I'm sure sometimes you forget to turn your phone off. Apparently somebody is Brother Warren Storm. <laughs> Uh, I thought I put this on Do Not Disturb. Brother Warren, what's he calling me for? Probably to tell me that he, oh, hey, I disconnected the lift gate to your box truck, and this is how you connect it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Brother Warren. Um, okay, now, abide in Christ. Jesus is saying, uh, he talks about abiding in him. He talks about bearing fruit. And he talks about having joy, having joy. Um, uh, what, I, what we began to sp uh, talk about is obviously the subject of joy and how a Christian is supposed to get joy and the world's philosophy on gaining it through stuff and entertainment and money and uh, uh, how popular you might be and uh, the difference between joy and happiness. Now, I said, number one, you do not get joy because you get saved. You don't get joy because you get saved. You didn't get saved and all of a sudden become like, you know, Tigger. Bouncing around. Woohoo! Life is great. You didn't become uh, um, uh, 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 full of joy, your cup running over and just spilling out ever over everybody about whatever, some, some joy. Um, uh, number two was, uh, uh, number one was you don't get joy just because you get saved. Number two was, once you do get saved, joy becomes available. Joy, real joy, God's joy, heavenly joy, becomes available after you get saved. So you get saved, it didn't make all your problems go away. You got saved, it didn't make your bills go away. It didn't make your heartaches go away. It didn't make anything go away. But what it did is, is it put it on its head and said, Hey, all those things in the light of eternity, I'm not going to hell. All these things matter, and I've got to take care of them and all that. But at the end of the day, Jesus Christ saved me. I know that I'm going to heaven. I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. Now, uh, uh, and, 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 and I have all these problems and things to, to, to still care for, but now I have someone who will help me care for them. And that was Jesus. That was Jesus. And once you get saved, joy becomes available. It becomes available, just like walking into a restaurant. You didn't walk into a restaurant and get full. You walked into a restaurant, sat down at the table, grabbed a menu or, or the buffet or whatever. You ordered what you ordered, and they cooked it up and brought it out to you. You took the necessary steps to get full, but you could not get full until you got into the restaurant. You could not. You, hey, I, my, my vehicle, my gas needs, or my gas needs car. My car needs gas, amen. My vehicle needs fuel. Well, what do you do? You go to the place that has the fuel. You do what's necessary. It's the same thing with joy. Just because you got saved, it didn't make you joyful. It made joy available to you. I said next that joy is a fruit. Joy is a fruit. Remember I had that, you repeated it back to me. Joy is a fruit. And then what, what about fruit? Fruit must be grown. Fruit is something that, it, that grows. It just doesn't, you don't plant a seed and pop. There it is. It's not popcorn, even though that's something that has to, well, anyway. Uh, 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 it's not popcorn. It's not instant joy. Fruit must be grown. Fruit must be grown, but we have to factor this in. If joy is a fruit and it must be grown, you have to take in the time factor. Fruit takes time to grow. Fruit takes time to to grow. Don't get impatient with yourself. Don't get in such a hurry. Don't, um, uh, don't uh, uh, push the issue. Fruit is something that has to be grown, and it takes time. Um, uh, time after time after time, uh, people get frustrated with, um, with their, um, their growth, and they think, well, uh, I should be past this already. I, I, even as a Christian, I grew, man, I grew up in church. Grew up in church, and I got saved in church. Man, I, I, got, I got engaged right down here in front of this very altar, in front of this very pulpit, in, in, in this room. I got engaged here, and I got married right here. That did not save me. I, I didn't, that didn't save me. I got, but but it, it, it's something special to me. And like I said this morning, church, 
Church is that brook in the way for me. It, it has been for such a long time. Church, the service, the singing, the people. There's something wholesome about it. There's something holy about it. There's something special about it. Church is my brook in the way. Um, uh, and, and I look at myself sometimes and I say, Jackson, you ought to be better than that. You should be moved on from that already. You, you shouldn't have a problem with that. You shouldn't be that way. But the devil knows uh, uh, where the, the gaps are in your wall. God, uh, the devil knows where your weak points are. The devil knows how to get in and what buttons to push with you. He knows exactly how to put things in front of you and, and, and get your mind thinking. And Man, I fight that all the time. I fight that all the time. My thoughts, my thoughts, my thoughts, my thoughts make my thoughts uh, before the Lord. What does the scripture say? Bringing every thought into captivity. Bringing every thought, man, that's a hard thing to do. But if you'll engage in it, it's better to get, it's, folks, it's better to fend off three and let seven in than to let 10 in. It's better, and then you work and you grow and you grow and you grow and you grow. Don't get impatient with yourself. Ask God for patience. Say, dear God, that's been a prayer of mine. Dear God, give me patience. Be patient, not God, give me patience. Be patient with me. Be patient with me because I'm working on myself. Heavenly Father, I'm still trying. I'm still growing. Now, uh, uh, fruit is something that grows and it takes time to grow. God is working in you. What does scripture say? He says, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. God is working in you. What is he doing? I'll tell you what he's doing. God is making you like Jesus. You say, nah, yes, he is. Scripture teaches that we're all going to be Christ-like one day. We're all going to be like Christ. And as I said this morning, uh, the Christian life is letting Christ live through us. Letting, let me be like, I want to be like Christ. I want to be like Jesus. You say, well, that's, that, you, that doesn't mean you can't be like that. That'd be like folks who believe in Buddha walking around saying, I want to be, be like Buddha. I want to be like Confucius. I want to be like Muhammad uh, or Muhammad as you got to get that in there. Uh, I want to be like Muhammad. I want to be like whoever, you know, what, whoever they follow. I want to be like Mike, Michael Jordan. Well, you folks, you can be like all those people you want. Your idols but I'm going to be like the only one that makes a difference. I'm going to be the one that has the power of all powers. I want to be like the one that owns the cattle on a million hills. I want to be the one that says, my father is rich in houses and lands. Man, I want to be like the one who owns it all, who said, let there be, and there was, and it was good. That's the one I want to model myself after. And you say, that you can't attain that. You're right, I can't attain it yet. Not in this fleshly body, but I'm going to try. Bringing into captivity every thought. Bringing into captivity all the deeds of the body and telling myself, no, Jackson, don't do that. Don't think that. Don't say that. Don't go there. And I fail. I fail. But I promise you, I put on the whole armor of God and I go back out and fight. I fight. I fight. I fight. I fight the flesh. I fight the flesh. I don't want to give in to the flesh. But I, at the same time, I can condemn my, no, no, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I can convict myself and I can get right with God and, and, and get, back on, get back in the saddle, so to speak, and keep on down the trail for Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like him. And he said here um, uh, uh, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. See, I don't want to just be some hellfire, damnation, Chandler, uh, Chandler shaking, paint peeling, Bible thumping, pulpit pounding, um, uh, foot stomping, red hot preacher. I don't want to just be like, man, that guy's on, that guy, man. He, uh, no, I want to have joy. I, I, I want to have joy. I want to be a well-rounded Christian because I believe Jesus was well-rounded. If you look at how Jesus handled Everyone that he encountered was well-rounded. He was sharp. He was polished. He didn't fly off the handle as I'm prone to do, as my father is prone to do. <laughs> prone to do. Sitting here this morning, I'm like, okay. Where's the, I need a cane. Whew. <laughs> or put, yeah, there we go. I, 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 or maybe um, slip like a, a, a dog shock collar on him, and if he gets too loud, zip. Uh, but uh, Brother Alex, maybe you can put a le red laser beam back there and shine it on him. You know, I just <laughs> but I, 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 the Lord knows I'm prone to fly off the handle. What does Paul say? You guys know that, that, that um, 
he puts Dr. Seuss to shame when he says, the good that I would, that I allow not, that I do, I would not, the things that I would, that I not. I know I'm butchering it. I'm doing it on purpose. But I try to read that full in sentences, and I'm like, the, 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 I okay. The things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. And the things that I do want to do, I don't do. But it's a war, he says. I find then a, a war. There's a battle. I find a conflict. The good man on the inside, the spirit, the new man, the Christian man wants to do good. But this flesh, this vile flesh, Philippians calls it vile. This vile flesh that I'm in, one day I'll get out of and I will be like Jesus. But I can have a little bit of Jesus now. I can have the wisdom now. The Bible teaches in Proverbs that the wisdom that laid the foundations of the earth, that created the caterpillar, that created the butterfly, that created the oceans, that created the mountains, that said, let there be in the, and the stars shine and the sun shines and the moon shines. And the moon shines. The moon does everything it's supposed to. The moon does it. Here I am talking about the glory of God. Uh, uh, anybody got any? Uh, anyway, um, but all this, is, God, said the, God says the wisdom that I used to create all of this, you can have that. Now, not to create the world, not to, uh, 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 there are people who think that God, we are God. You get that? The trees are God. The earth is God. We are God. No. There is but one God, and he told his son to tell us that we can have joy, joy, even if the clowns get elected, even if the, 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 the prisoners are running the, or the, 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 the insane are running the insane asylum, or if the prisoners are running the prison. But there are steps. There are certain steps, and the number one step, uh, he said it was in, um, uh, oh, where is it? Uh, verse number three, abide in me. Do you, I want joy, real joy. And the number one step to having joy is he said, abide in me. Abide in me and I in you. Now, I think the I in you has two meanings. Number one, get saved. Number two, let him reign on you. Let him reign in you. Let him have his way with you. Let him, let him say, hey, Let's do this. Let's go there. Let's make sure we let the Holy Spirit have the throne of your heart. I in you. Now you abide in me and I'll abide in you. You say, well, how can, how does he abide in me? Well, you get saved. You got to get saved. And then you give him, you give him his way. What do you want me to do, Lord? What would you have me to do, Lord? And then you do it. And then abide in him. Jesus said, abide in me. And that's the first step. The first step is not, um, the farmer's market. The first step is not Darlington Farms, amen? The first, hey, the first step is not the air show. The first step is not the embassy. It's not the festival of trees. It's not um, uh, uh, the Tin Caps baseball game. It's not the Comets. And I, I mean, I, I like the Comets. We used to have, you, do you remember the football team we had, the Fort Wayne Freedom? Oh my goodness, anybody ever been to the game? Do you remember the intro? That clip from Braveheart, they'll never take our freedom. Uh, and the fireworks and the, ah, the cars coming out and doing, ah, it was nuts. That was great. That's not first place. Back in the day, it was the Fort Wayne Wizards. Fort Wayne Wizards. Uh, they're not first. The Little League Baseball game's not first. He says the first step to joy is abide in me. Now, nothing wrong with Fort Wayne freedom, nothing wrong with the Little League, nothing wrong with... um. Uh, uh, the football games or the, uh, the whatevers. As long, I mean, as long as they're not, uh, I, I don't believe a Christian should go to uh, rock concerts. The book of Isaiah specifically says um, uh, going to church is better. Not, no, I'm paraphrasing here. It's better. It's better to go to church than it is a rock concert. It says You say, no, nah, uh, yes, it does. I'll, I'll show it to you one of these days. It's, I, I got to find it. It's in Isaiah. Uh, the word uh, uh, abide, abide, it means... Um, uh, it comes from a Greek word, uh, I, I think I'm pronouncing this right, mino, mino, and it means, it, uh, it's similar to the word we use in uh, John 14 too, which is translated to mansions. Mansions, you say mino, the word abide is translated to mansions. Yeah, get this. We are to abide in Christ, or if you will, we are to mansion in Christ. 
You say, well, if that's the way it's translated, it means to dwell in Christ, live in Christ. Now, I think it's interesting that the word uh, 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 abide is re uh, related to mansions. It's not related to room. It's not related to um, shack. It's not related to poverty. It's not related to uh, 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 anything small. It's related to something big. Because I think when we abide in Christ, big things can happen. And I think when we abide in Christ, he gives us a lot of room, and he gives us a lot of grace, and he gives us a lot of mercy. Now, we are to abide in Christ or to mansion in Christ. If you do not make Christ your life, you cannot bear fruit. You cannot have joy. Now, you may laugh and you may smile and you may be happy for the moment, but you will not have lasting joy. Your joy will not grow unless Christ is your life. Now, don't forget that joy is a fruit. Remember that. Joy is a fruit, and it must be grown. Joy is a fruit according to Scripture, according to God Almighty, His written words preserved unto us in the English language. He says joy is something that has to be grown. Uh, I know uh, uh, Miss Brown and uh, uh, Brother Stoltz and Brother Branning and, uh, and, and maybe some others. Uh, maybe they, you grow uh, you grow flowers, you grow vegetables, you grow peppers and and uh, cucumbers and green beans and uh, 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 pumpkins. Apparently, in the backyard, uh, you grow all kinds of things. But what are those things? They are the fruit of the vine. What? Well, how'd they get there? They had to be grown. Well, how were they grown? The right ingredients, the right steps. Do you want joy in your life? I know I want joy. Now, you find temporary relief from depression. You can. You can take uh, uh, pills. You can forget about things. You can drink it away. Uh, but you'll never have real joy. Now, folks, how many times? I, I've said this last week, and I'll say it again. I, I've done it, and you've done it. You go on vacation, and you come back from vacation feeling like you need a vacation to recover from your vacation. Uh, I, I, I try to be a good husband when I get back into town. Um, this week I did, um, uh, 2,691 miles, I think 2,681, something like that o over 2,600 miles. I went Fort Wayne to Mesquite to uh, Cowell, Texas, to Gainesville, Texas, to Chicago, to Lowell, Indiana, to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And by the time I got home, and, and you're driving, there's a lot of scenery and all that stuff. And, and Jamie's like, oh, it's a, like a little mini vacation, and you got your RV. It's not a vacation. Driving for nearly 11 hours a day and going, where can I stop? Where can I stop? Where can I stop? And looking and watching out for DOT and, and, and interstate cops and uh, people slamming on their brakes and animals running. It's not a vacation. But it, I'm not out there breaking my back. But I'm out there, and it's senior. But I, by the time I get home, I need to rest from all that rest. <laughs> by the time I get home from a vacation, I'm like, man, I need a vacation from the vacation, especially if you take kids with you. I need a vacation from my vacation. Uh, uh, we try to go to these things of football games and baseball games and basketball games, and we spend our money. And what are we looking for? We're looking for fellowship and enjoyment and entertainment, and relaxation, and before you know it, you're screaming at the stinking referee. Before you know it, you're yelling at the, at the coach. What is wrong with you? We're yelling at the TV. They can't hear you. Here I am going, it's Sunday. This is great. Great time. To make. Folks, people were crying all over the auditorium this morning. Oh, that was great. People crying in Sunday school class. This is fantastic think it's great people are crying yes it shows emotion it shows that the holy spirit is present it's fantastic uh uh it's sunday and 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 uh, things are great and it's a beautiful day outside and we had a good crowd and everybody's joyful and all these things it's all wonderful and then uh, uh i get to relax and chill out and watch football and have some food and hang out with my boys and 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 the bears are like you get 17 weeks of torture um, uh, but it's my torture. It's special torture. <laughs> so we sit down to watch it, and what, what are we watching it for? Hope, we're hopeful that our team wins. That's all it is. It's just hopeful. But what do we do? Ah, oh, no. Oh, it's not relaxing at all. It's not comforting. It's got nothing to do with it. There's no joy in that. 
There's no real joy. And I've done it too. If the Bears won today, okay, great. Now what? Next week, we do the same thing. It brings me no real joy. There's no relaxation, re relaxation in that. Um, uh, so happiness is what these things bring us, uh, these activities. And what happiness comes from diversion. And happiness that is produced by diversion is not the answer to joy. Understand that. Um, uh, uh, getting our minds off of things. Diversion is a humanistic tool. It's not a theistic tool. You won't find in the Bible that God uses diversions to get people's minds off reality to make them happy. God always says, here's the answer to remedy your reality. For, you know, when we go to the doctor, I, I told a doctor, I was like, look, doc, doc I'm, not looking, I'm not looking for a... Uh, 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 um, just a, a temporary fix. I'm looking for like a long term. Let's go deep. Let's do blood tests. Let's do family history. Let's find out what what makes me tick and why I'm not ticking the right way. And I don't mean my heart's bad. I'm just talking in general. Uh, uh, what what makes things tick? Well, how do I work? What's my history? Instead of just coming in and looking at my generic chart that says I didn't have kidney disease and I don't have a uh, cataracts and I don't have lung disease. No, 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 no. Well, you're a pretty healthy guy. Yeah, well, what's, what's up with this? Well, it's just... No, don't give me some generic answer. I want to know how I work. I want to know how I function so I can fix it, so I can live my life. I don't want to be on pills for the rest of my life. I don't want to wear this for the Now, I understand some, some things are, I, I, everybody's different. I get that. But I'm talking, people come in and they, well, it's just, and there's ju just a generic, nah. No, I want to know. Don't let me walk out of here going, I wonder what happened there. And God never gives us a, well, I don't want to. The Bible is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, and it shows us the way through prayer, through counsel, through faithfulness to church. God will shine a light. You'll have one of those light bulb moments when you're going, I don't know what decision to make. Something will happen, and you'll have peace about it. You go, I, it's okay. God's given me peace. God doesn't use diversion to help us find joy. He uses real solutions. Now, the first step to having joy then is to abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Live in him. Live in him. Now, how do you live in him? John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. To live in Christ is to live in scripture. To live in scripture is to obey it, hear it, do it. It, it really is that. I want to be like Jesus. Okay, then find out what the Bible says and live that way. And here's the scary thing, though, because a lot of people, a lot of young Christians and whatnot, they never get the, the hermeneutics, so to speak. They never get the, the homiletics and the, 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 uh, uh, the apologetics and the doctrines, and they think, well, let, let's go crazy here. Um, disobedient kids have to be stoned in the street. <laughs> no, that, nope, we don't do that anymore. We're no longer under the law, we're under grace. Uh, you know, some people who are revved up, we're New Testament Christians. New Testament. We don't th throw um, uh, uh, people who, who have a same-sex um, uh, relationship with others off of buildings. We're not Islam, uh, we're not um, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, we're not um, uh, any of those guys. We don't, we don't do that. We believe that... Um, uh, uh, instead of throwing off buildings, we'll throw tracks at them and, and go, not, not literally, but we'll go and knock on their door and tell them that Jesus loves them. Instead of throwing people off of buildings like they do in other countries, we believe in going to the buildings and throwing ourselves at the buildings where those people live and winning them to Christ because Christ can take a homosexual and Christ can take a drug dealer and God, Christ can take a gossip and Christ can take a, a, a bitter old hag and a bitter old man and Christ can take a, a, a drug user and God can take a, a, um, a drug producer and God can take a prostitute and God can take a pimp and God can take anybody and make a somebody out of them if they'll accept Christ into their heart and believe on Jesus and start living for him. God can take somebody's life, anybody's life, a nobody, and take their life and turn them into a somebody for Christ. Now, folks, don't listen to, to um, uh, uh, 
especially for the older folks, when the doctor says you need to slow down, you need to not, you, you don't need to do, and now I understand if you just had knee surgery, just had back surgery, take your, the, the wise as serpents, harmless as doves, let's be smart, discernment, knowledge, wisdom. Uh, Brother Joe, he is a go, move, do kind of guy, Brother Joe uh, Goebel. And uh, he had um, stints put in and all that heart stuff done and um, a valve, I think, was done. And, he, and he's having a hard time. And I told him, I said, take your time. Take, your, take time now so you can use your time later. There are seasons of being down and being uh, Miss Kathy, Miss Church forever because that stinking knee wouldn't get right. Still isn't. She had to take her time. So when the doctor, so sometimes when the doctor tells you to slow down, slow down. But if you know in your heart you've still got it in you to do something for God, don't slow down. Give up your bus route. Give up your Sunday school class. Give up the choir. Don't, don't you don't need to do that anymore. You shouldn't do, you shouldn't go those things. You shouldn't go those places anymore. Don't climb the ladders anymore. Don't um uh, uh, hang up uh, things anymore. Don't do the decorations in the building anymore. Hey folks, if you if you're gonna do something, let's do it for God. The Bible says whatsoever we do, do unto the glory of God. The Bible says to abide in Christ, not to run from Him. So many people say. I've got a lot going on in my life. Let me drop my ministry. I've got a lot going on in my, and the ministry you do is only once a week. Why not drop something you're doing during the week? Why don't you go to your employment and say, hey, you're working me 55 hours a week. I, I can only do 45. I, that's, a, that's a sacrifice. You don't want to know why? Because, and we need that, especially in this economy. And I'm not here to tell you that if you do, if it, it, not, according to the Bible, I'm talking if you're acting by faith and you're saying, no, this is what God wants me to do, and I, you'd have to kill me to get me to drop what I'm doing for the Lord. I'm not dropping what I'm doing for the Lord. I'll get 15 jobs before I quit church. I will find the job that suits me so I can be where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, I know the Lord may lead you some way, and you may have to take a job for a season, and you may have to, to do something for a season, but as long as you've got your eye on the prize of living for Christ and abiding in Christ and Christ in you, and you got to hop over here and hop over there and find, and find the right place and do the right thing, and God opens the door, and you know that's the door he open then do it but don't you drop don't you don't you drop things from christ run to christ and abide in christ don't run from christ the problem a whole lot of christians have is that they're not doing enough for god not that they're doing too much god's joy will make you happy in your problems god's joy will make you happy in your problems i'll say it one more time god's joy will make you happy in your problems not happy about your problems but happy in your problems God's joy will give you joy in the midst of your problems. Abide, live, mansion, stay with Christ all the time. You'll never be happy. You'll never be happy. And you'll never have joy unless you live in Christ. I'm telling you that right now, that's a guarantee. Um, I think it was Thursday. As I was heading to Chicago, I took my Bible. And um, uh I put it in the driver's or in the passenger seat next to me. And I, I set it up on the, the lumbar back and I put the seatbelt on it. <laughs> kind of goofy. But I said, I want Jesus to ride with me today. And I put him right there in the seat next to me. I know he's right here, but symbolically, I could look over there and have a conversation with the Lord. You're like, that's that's weird, Pastor Jake. I don't care. I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that I'm trying to live in Christ. Now I'm by myself. I don't, I don't, I don't care. I, I will do, that's, that's weird. That's, you do you and I'll do me and we'll stand at the judgment. Not saying my way's better, but I'm just trying, I want to live for Christ. I want to live in Christ and I want Christ to live in me. And the best way to do that is to abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Now abide in Christ and you'll produce fruit. Number one uh, 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 for tonight is abide in Christ. Number two is just the word fruit. Fruit, you abide in Christ by spending time with him. You abide, with, you abide in Christ by spending time with him. You spend time with him by reading his word 
and praying. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. There was a man who drove um, Billy Sunday around. And uh, uh, he said, um, uh, was it Billy Sunday? Yeah, it was Billy Sunday. Who drove Billy Sunday around, that great evangelist, and, and said, Billy Sunday talked to the Lord all the time. Billy Sunday would be in the back seat talking, and the driver would say, excuse me, Mr. Sunday, what'd you say? And Billy Sunday would just keep talking under his breath and kind of uh, whispering and talking under his breath, you know. And, and, and the driver came to realize he was praying. He was talking to the Lord. He said sometimes they'd, they'd stay, they'd be put up in the same um, a hotel room or the same, uh, someone would house them. And he said that man, Brother uh, Moody, or excuse me, not D.L. Moody, um, he had a big old beard. Uh, D, uh, 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 Billy Sunday would be shaving and in the mirror and, and, and uh, he said he'd walk by the, the restroom there and he'd hear Billy Sunday. And he said he stopped and heard Billy Sunday one morning as he stood by the bathroom wall on the outside and kind of listened. And Billy Sunday said, Heavenly Father, this is a great proposition that I've got to go and speak to these thousands of people and I'm not quite sure what I have to say. Oh, Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd give me power, that you'd give me wisdom, that you'd let me speak the word of truth, that you would help me. Oh, God, give me the Holy Spirit today and let me see people saved and people's lives helped. And, and oh, Heavenly Father, and he would just talk to the Lord all the time. And you're like, well, I Brother Hiles said he prayed for Miss Beverly Hiles 10 times a day. And I don't mean get on your knees and pray for 30 minutes. For, but he would say he'd slip away for, for 15 seconds here and 30 seconds there and a minute and a half over there and two minutes over here. And, and he'd pray for his wife and he'd pray for his children and he'd pray for his church and he'd ask for power, love, wisdom, and understanding. And he'd get alone and he'd say, oh, dear God, help me today. Oh, dear God, help me today. I, folks, I drive that truck. I ask God for prayer for all the time, safety. Oh, God, put angels above me, around me, below me, on the sides of me. Uh, I go through construction sites sometimes, and I've got just inches on each side. And I'm like, oh, Heavenly Father, uh, this is not my equipment. I don't own this. This isn't my trailer. This isn't my truck. Uh, Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you you'd give me a good reputation, reputation as a driver. Don't let me damage things. Don't let me hurt things. Oh, Heavenly Father, give me a good testimony here. Don't let me hurt anything. Oh, God, get me through this safely. Above all, let me get home to my family. Oh, dear God in heaven, help me. I watched a truck as, as we were going through the, uh, the mountains of uh, West Virginia. No. Yes, West Virginia, uh, there was a construction zone and this man wasn't paying attention and it was a tight curve and he, uh, in a black Dodge Ram and he drove right off the road um, uh, and right in, I mean, talking right into some trees and those branches came right through his window and as we passed by so slowly, his face was covered in blood. Those branches tore him up. I, he looked to be unconscious uh, and the construction workers were all clamoring, and, and I mean, it happened almost right in front of me. Everybody slamming on their brakes. Uh, a, a, a truck coming up by the Indianapolis uh, 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 airport just burst into flames. And this guy, I watched him jump out of his truck, grab it, run around to the other side, grab his bag, and pertinent things out of there. Man, oh man, I pray for safety all the time. I pray for safety all the time because my number could be called one day and I don't want to live a fruitless life. I don't want to live a joyless life. I don't want to live a life that was empty and that didn't amount to anything. I want to do something with my life. And I think as long as I'm a prayer warrior and I'm a Bible warrior and I'm a church warrior and I'm a soul winning warrior, I think as, as, as long as I'm useful to the cause of Christ, he will continue to use me. Continue to use me. Now, you may not be, feel like you're being used lately. I'll tell you right now, I have a bunch of tools downstairs. I've got several tape measures. I've got drills and impact drivers. I've got screwdrivers and, and uh, razor knives and T-squares and levels and um, uh, uh, all kinds of screws and nails and um, uh, hardware. i got all kinds of stuff and saws and um, uh, uh, what's that, concrete drill driver. And i got all kinds of stuff, all kinds I don't use them every day, but, some, but when the job requires what I need, what the job calls for, what I need, I need certain tools. I go and I grab that tool. You know what that tool is? That tool's available to me. That tool's available to me. Now ask yourself tonight, am I available to God? Am I available to God? I may not be getting used all the time. You used to be a, a hammer on a construction site, amen? That was your use back then, but now you, 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 it's different. The hammer's not so much used as a screw gun is, but a hammer still comes in handy. 
You may say, man, I used to, uh, when I had my energy, when I had my health, when I had my youth, I was doing for God constantly. And now that your youth is gone and your body has betrayed you and you can't get around as much as you used to, for some of you, maybe you're too young. Miss Sarah's uh, 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 plagued by kidney problems. Sometimes they just attack her. She also has the Dan disease. I mean, oh, hi, Dan. Uh, she, she, <laughs> uh, she, she has problems. You have problems. We all have problems, heartaches, depression, anxiety, all these things that we fight. But make yourself available to God. You say, I may not be getting used every day, but I'm still available. I'm still available. The way that we abide in Christ is by reading and praying. You spend time with him by going to church. You spend time with him to listening to the preacher. What's the result of that? What's the result of reading and praying and going and listening? You obey his commands. You obey. There's no way you can go to church for years and years. One or two things are going to happen. You're going to obey or you're going to disobey. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe, but it's also the best way to grow in Christ. You cannot abide in Christ without obeying his commands. You cannot, obey, you cannot abide in Christ without obeying his commands. So in short, once you start abiding in Christ, you'll start producing fruit and the fruit of souls and the fruit of righteousness, which is the cause that brings the effect of joy. Uh, I, I went soul winning with a, a friend some time ago, and uh, well, where did we go? Oh, somewhere off of State Street, I believe, and we, we knocked on doors, and uh, three people in a row, three, three houses in a row. One was a nurse. Uh, she invited us in. We sat down on the couch, and she accepted the Lord so easily. So I mean, it's like she was waiting for us. Yeah, come on in, have a seat. It's like she, it's like she was waiting. We opened the door, and or she opened the door. Yeah, we opened the door. Hey, my home. Uh, are you going to heaven? Uh, yeah, are you going to heaven? Uh, 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 she opened the door, and and uh, we said, hey, this is uh, 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 Jake and, and Mike, and three years Baptist church, and we're just out inviting people to church, and da 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 da. She said, come on in, have a seat. And we sat down, and it's she sat down on the edge of the couch with her hands folded and her knees together like she was waiting. It, man, it was incredible. She's, like she was waiting on us. And she just, I mean, just one, two, three, four. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know that. And man, I walked out of there, felt, Brother Alex, I felt like I was floating. And I'm not trying to get all charismatic. <laughs> Uh, I didn't, uh, your brother Jim back there like, what is happening? Nothing, I'm just mocking. Um, he's like, thumbs up, brother. Uh, <laughs> um, I felt like I was floating walking out of there. What, what, why did I feel that way? Joy, the Bible says there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Well, what do you think I'm going to feel? If heaven feels joy, what do you think I'm going to feel? Three people in a row. And Mike knew Spanish. The third guy was a Spanish guy who he led to the Lord at the door in Spanish. And we walk, I walked away going, this is great. The joy that I had. And you say, well, how do you know it produced joy? because of the way that I'm speaking of it right now. Amen. It was such a wonderful experience that I can look back on it now and go, that was incredible how great that was. That was awesome. The Bears don't produce joy. They win a game, okay, yay, they won, let's move on. And I'm, that's great, it's wonderful. I mean, that, that's, that's wonderful. I've had answers to prayer. I've had all kinds of things that have happened that have been on a small scale and, 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 and things that have been diversions of happiness that made me happy, but that didn't produce joy. Winning souls and growing the fruit of righteousness produce real joy. Now, God's divine order is abide, fruit, then joy. Get uh, Psalms 126, verse five and six says, they that sow in tears... Anybody know the rest? Shall reap in joy. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. First, there must be tears. That's the cause. Remember the cause and effect? Cause and effect. Remember the cause. What's the cause? Souls. What's, what's, what's the cause? Or what's the, what's the, um, uh, the, what's the, uh, the end game? Souls. What's the cause? Tears. 
What's the result? Joy. The, or the effect is joy. Verse 6 says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, folks, right there, that's a recipe for joy. That's, that's a recipe for the um, pertinent ingredients, the necessary ingredients for joy. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy. Why? Why? Why do you have the joy? Is it just a song that we sing or is it a real joy? Joy comes from winning souls. Joy comes from sharing the gospel. Joy comes from the fruits of the Spirit. Now, you go, you weep, you spread seed, you get some sheaves, you get some fruit, and you come out with rejoicing. I mean, that's a lot of work, and it is work. That's what I told Brother Warren Storm, standing out here. He said, well, how do you do what you did before? I said, work. It's going to take work. Work. The people the, the, in the book of Nehemiah said the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. I want to let you know that your pastor has a mind to work. I want to work. I want to do what's right. I want to, I want to serve the Lord. I want to go. I want to weep. I've been asking the Lord to give me tears over souls. I want to go. I want to weep. I want to spread the seed. I want to get some sheaves, which are souls. I want to get some fruit and come out with rejoicing. Uh, Psalm 126 is just an illustration of God's order, or as we said in the, in, in the, uh, uh, the first part of this message, uh, the prescription for joy. The prescription for, for joy. Abide, fruit, joy. Abide, fruit, joy. As I've been driving, uh, I went to a, a Middletown, Ohio. Uh, let's see. Two, four, five, seven, nine, eleven. I went to, uh, was it eleven? It was eleven. Uh, to Middletown, Ohio, eleven times two weeks ago. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And um, I couldn't take uh, 70. Route 70 south because it was 151 miles. And 151 miles times two times four, you can't do that in a day. So there's a shortcut, which is 128 miles. And that is uh, uh, you get out uh, in New Haven and you go out past the truck stop and you go in uh, uh, to 101. 101, and you take a ride on 101 and you go through Monroeville. And you go all the way up to 24 or 224 and you take a left. And then you jog back over to 101, which is like half a mile down the road. You get on 101, you take that up to 33. You take 33 into Rockford, Ohio, I believe it is. Um, uh, and, and, and it splits. You take another right onto, I think, uh, I can't, 81, I think that is. Uh, and then you take a, another right and it splits. 33 to the left, which will take you to 70. And uh, uh, 49 to the right, which will take you to Greenville, Ohio. So I got on 49, and I hopscotched down to 49, and, and I got down to Greenville, and I jump, jumped over onto 127, Harrison, Paris Road or something like that. Jumped over to 127, 127 to uh, Ohio 503, which is like this. Uh, uh, Ohio 503, Ohio 503 to 40 East. Hop on that, jog on to Perry, uh, South Perry County Line Road. Take that up to Ohio 725, left on 725 all the way up to 4, 4 to uh, whatever street it is that I turned on to deliver. I could do that in my, I, I didn't need directions anymore. I can do that for the rest of my life. I'll know how to get there. Without a map, without directions, without anything. My, my muscle memory would just know how to do it. But do you know what I encountered out there? A whole lot of farmers. Farmers, farmers, farmers. What were they doing out there? They were harvesting their crop. They were bringing in the fruits of their labor. Now, take one of those farmers and let that farmer go out to bring in his harvest and there is no harvest. How... How happy is he going to be when he comes back to the house? How happy is he going to be when he comes in with his hat clenched in his hand and he's gritting his teeth and he's angry because there is no harvest to bring in? Let a farmer go out and gather the harvest when the insects have eaten it up. 
Let a, let a, let a farmer go, ha- go out there and find his harvest destroyed. How happy do you think he's going to be when he comes back? Not very happy. But let, that, let another farmer, let that same farmer go out to the field and gather the harvest that he's planted and worked on and cultivated and watered and, and catch, kept a watchful eye over and made sure that it was healthy and let him see as huge as a crop that he can bring in as possible. What's, what's going to happen? He's going to have a big old smile on his face once he takes that grain truck, once he takes that truck to the, to the uh, facility and has it weighed. That's what they do. They all bring in their stuff and they take it to a processing plant and they all get in there and they weigh their stuff and, and uh, uh, then they empty out and they have to weigh out so they know the correct weight. Let him get a heavy weight. Let the more money, the better, right? He's going to have a big old smile on his face. He's going to be happy. Why? Because when he brings in a good crop, he rejoices, when he brings in a crop, he rejoices. I mean, we've done that on the bus route. We've done that out with Thanksgiving dinners. We've done that out with everything. You go out and you visit and you invite people and you invite people and you invite people. And then what happens when they show up? They showed up. I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> You're happy. A visitor came. Your visitors came. That family invited or that you invited, they came. Those bus kids that you signed up for the bus and the parents signed the permission form and, and, and they came and, and, oh man, this is great. People are coming. What do we do? We rejoice. But what happens when we sow a harvest and we sow and we work and man, it just didn't, it, we're not happy. We're not happy. And we can't help it, whatever the emotion is. The same thing is the Christian just like that farmer it is with us. The rejoicing Christian is a soul-winning Christian. There's no way to be happy in the Christian life apart from being a soul winner. You may be content. You may be comfortable. Your conscience may be clear. But you can't have what Jesus talks about as real joy without bringing your sheaves in with you, without seeing people saved. Folks, I don't care if it's one do something that'll spark a fire. Do something that'll get you going. John 15, 15, 11 says, these things have I spoken. These things have I spoken. This is what he's saying. He's, he says, um, uh, 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 there is no way to have real joy without the presence of fruit. If you do what I taught you in the first 10 verses, remember I said um, uh, the first 10 verses were a precursor to verse 11. My joy will remain in you, but it will produce fruit, big fruit, Full fruit, much fruit, much fruit. Abide, fruit, joy. God does not want us to have empty churches. God doesn't want us to have empty hearts. God doesn't want us to have empty minds. God doesn't want us to have empty pockets. But I feel that if we take our minds and our hearts and our church and our pockets and we empty them out for the Lord, and I'm not saying giving your savings, I'm not saying empty out your 401, I'm not saying give your retirement. No, folks, please understand. I'm saying if God can have our heart, we'll be willing to give everything else. Folks, there's more lasting joy from soul winning than there is anything else. Nobody's going to be laying on their deathbed and said, man, I sure witnessed to too many people. I sure wish I didn't waste that time telling people about Jesus. Man, oh man, I'm on my deathbed and I'm getting ready to die. And I kind of just feel like I I told too many people about Jesus. Nobody's going to say that. No Christian that's right with God, no Christians that's, that's right in their mind will say, I, I told too many people about Jesus. He says, uh, Jesus says, fruit, John 15, 2, he says, fruit, then more fruit. In verse 5, he says, much fruit. The relationship developing here is a direct relationship between fruit and joy. It's, 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 it, you know it, you felt it, and I have too. When that visitor comes to church, when that loved one comes to church, there's excitement. Hey, sit with me. Hey, come with me. And you're praying the whole time. Dear God, please don't let the preacher offend my visitor. (laughs) Dear Heavenly Father, please, please let my visitor like the church. Please let the visitor stay and and, and get baptized and, and become a member and start tithing and get on a bus route or teach a class or sing in the choir or work in the nursery or become an usher or, 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 or. That's what we want for our visitors. We want our visitors to come and get planted and get rooted and become something for Christ because that's we feel like that's fruit. Folks, if they bowed their head and said, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that if I died without you, I'd go to hell. Would you forgive my sin? Would you take me to heaven when I die? 
I confess that you're the Lord. I confess that I believe that you're the son of God and I need you to save me. That is fruit. That's fruit itself. But the fruit that we really, really covet after in a, in a good way is fruit that remains. I want fruit that remains. Just be that plastic fruit in that bowl that looks real, in the, but it's not real. Just fruit, that's fruit that remains. If you leave fruit out too long, it looks like remains. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I want fruit that remains, and so do you. Joy that remains full. He's showing us, Jesus is showing us again, uh, uh, that first we must abide in him, and second, we will have fruit, and ultimately, we will have joy. I, I got too close to Jesus. Nobody said that. I learned too much of Jesus. Nobody said that. I had too good of a relationship with Jesus. Nobody said that. So when everything's been said and done, there's going to be only, there's going to only be heaven and hell. That's it. Heaven and hell. The only thing that will matter is how many people we kept out of hell. You know, that's the only thing that's going to matter. Did you know it won't matter as much how, uh, uh, how, how many um, um, uh, solos that you sang in church? I mean, if you did it for the glory of God, it's got like, you know, a little bit in there. I mean, it tips the scale like an iota. But I believe the direct, I believe t uh, uh, time, talent, and treasure that are, that are unified between individuals and directed into a soul-winning, missions-supporting, um, uh, whether that be through the bus ministry or through worldwide missions, but a, an evangelistic church, evangelistic church, a church who evangelizes. If you'll put your time, talent, and treasure into that, God says, man, that, that, that matters. Because the only thing that matters at the end of the day is there's only two places, heaven and hell. Heaven and hell. And the only thing that's going to matter is how many people I kept out of there. Of course, it will matter your relationship with the Lord. But that, that all, it stacks upon itself. If you don't have a, right, a good relationship with the Lord, you're not going to be bringing in people for Christ. If you don't have a solid relationship with the Lord, you're not going to be seeing people saved. And you are not going to be producing fruit, which produces joy, and you will not have joy. It's not going to matter how much money you made, how big of a business you built, what kind of clothes you wore. Uh, uh, if you owned a big house and, and, a, and a cottage and, and all the cool cars, um, and I'm, I like that stuff, but that's not going to matter. What's going to matter is, is, did we keep people out of hell? And Three Years Baptist Church has propped itself up on that, vaunted itself on that, not cocky, but saying, hey, we're here to keep people out of hell. You know, that's the mission of our church. You know, the fire department is there to put out fires and to rescue people from the fire. The police force is, the police force is there to protect and serve. I think. The, <laughs> jab at me a little bit. You know, uh, the speed limits are there to keep people from speeding. Um, there are so many things that are put in place. They have their function. They have their function. What's our function? What, what, how do we, fun what's our deal? If people ask, what's Three Rivers all about? Well, we're a worship church. We're a, we support worldwide missions. Okay, cool, but do you support your neighborhood? How are you going to reach into Africa and Asia and not knock on your neighbor's door? Well, we're a, a community outreach church. Well, how do you, well, we give bread and turkeys and pies away to hungry. That's great. Wonderful, but do you give them the gospel? Three Rivers Baptist Church. What do you guys do? We keep people out of hell. Amen. That ought to be our slogan. Three Rivers, keeping people out of hell since 1994. Come on now. Amen. Keep people out of hell. Yes, glorify the Lord. But the goal is, is like I glorify, I get with the Lord and I love the Lord and I get in the Lord and I, and I juice myself up with the Lord so I can win souls and, the, and, and the, the cause and effect is getting to know God, getting power, love, wisdom, understanding, get what I need from Christ to be like Christ and then to go out and win souls. 
That's the goal. I mean, it's step one, get to know God. Step two, be like Jesus. Step three, go win souls. The result is joy. The result is joy. Carl Hatch. Where's Carl Hatch? Is he right there? Carl Hatch. You got to look up Carl Hatch. Read about Carl. We've had him here. Carl Hatch. Carl Hatch. Uh, Man, he would go into airports. He would go into bathrooms and airports and people are in the stalls. He would take tracks, Brother Lucas. He would take tracks and say, read this when you get a chance. (laughs) This was before cell phones and people took up extra time in stalls because they were playing Candy Crush in the stall. Um, uh, uh, This was before that people took newspapers in there, you know. But he'd say, here, you're in there a while. Read this. Read this. Read this. And he would go into elevators and people would be standing by him and he'd be like, oh, and he'd have his cane with him. He used his age. And people would be like, oh, let me get that for you. And, and they'd pick him up, Brother Alex. And, and he'd say, oh, oh. And he'd grab him and get him close to him and say, what's that say right there? What does this say? Somebody handed this to me. What's that say? You can be sure that you go to heaven. Would you want to read that with me? The guy was bold as a lion. He'd walk through airports and just drop, drop, drop. And people would be like, sir, sir, you're dropping these. <laughs> and he'd be, oh, what's that say? And lead people to the Lord. He was a wife-beating drunkard until he met Jesus. A hard, hard man. You would never know it. If you didn't know his testimony, you wouldn't know it. You'd find him to be one of the most joyful, happy, passionate, zealous men for Christ you ever met. Why? Because he met Jesus He tried to be like Jesus, and he went out and told people about Jesus. A, B, C, one, two, three, repeat after me. That's it, folks. That's it, folks. So to put a bow on it, if the number of people you kept out of hell would determine the completeness of your life, how complete would it be? How complete would it be? Folks, I don't need a diversion I need more fruit. So a soul winner who's sold out, keeping people out of hell, uh, that's somebody who's not nearly, not even close, not even nearly as susceptible to depression as one who shows up to go soul winning a part of the time, who shows up to church a part of the time, who reads their Bible a part of the time, who prays a part of the time. Somebody who reads and prays and walks and talks and listens and goes and obeys is somebody you're going to find as joyful. Joyful. I hated going out in public with my dad. Number one, because he would dress like a dad. You're like, what's that mean? I'm talking, he'd wear the socks. He'd wear the dad shoes, number one. Then he would wear socks that didn't match what he was wearing. The shirt and the, the khaki cargo shorts. His, his, his favorite team baseball cap. My dad, and, and the bandana for his, for his nose hanging out of his pocket. I'm like, oh my goodness. Please don't let me be this when I get older. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but we went out in public. We went to Lowe's. We went to Firestone uh, to look at some tires. We went here and there. And he's just talking to everybody. Talking to everybody. Talking to everybody. Talking to everybody. He's one of the um, most uh, emotional men you'll ever meet. But one of the greatest emotions he has is, is joy. It's joy. Now, it's mixed. It's because sometimes you can't tell. You're like, is that anger? Or is that He's like, I'm happy. And you're like, you don't look happy. Um, uh, 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 but his joy, why? Because he tells people about Jesus. He sits out his front, on his front porch and just goes fishing. <laughs> you're like, what's that mean? It means people walk by and he's like, hey, hey, how, how, how are you doing? How, gra- how green do you think my grass is? You're like, that, what, what do you mean? What do you think I should do with my roof? They're like, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> why are you asking me these questions? Because he's just throwing himself out there to tell people about Jesus. Just throwing him out there. He's retired. He can do that. Just, ah, there's one. Uh, I got, I witnessed to a guy. His name was David Jackson. No doubt. Uh, David Jackson on the front porch at my dad's house. And, and dad set it all up. He said, all right, Jake, just knock it down. And I w- was witnessing to the guy. And I can see it. Now I can kind of take my mind out of my body and see myself. And the way that I was standing was like I was going to punch him. (laughs) And I could tell his body language was like, 
this guy's scaring me, you know? <laughs> and dad, after it was all done, and, and I backed off and kind of relaxed and whatnot. I think that was the Holy Spirit taking over. And uh, he got saved. And uh, uh, it, was all, it was all good, um, all great, you know, and, and got saved. And I think he was from Detroit and um, uh, whatnot. And dad came out afterwards. And he's like, Jake, you got to be aware of your body language. I'm like, yeah, I know. I felt like I was up on the guy. But I was just like, I believe what I'm saying. I'm saying it with conviction. I'm saying it with confidence. I've been persuaded that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that he loves and that he saves and he still will and that the God that, that uses me will also give me joy. I want that joy. I want joy. How do I get joy? Telling people about Jesus. There's no greater message. There's no greater message. How did it feel to tell people that you were cancer-free? Or that, hey, I beat it. Or, hey, we've got it under control. What happened? There was a joy. There was some confidence saying, why? Because that was good news. Anybody in here like good news? Man, I like good news. I had folks call me, some of you don't. Uh, I had somebody call me the other day and said, I got good news and bad news. Give me the bad news first. And it wasn't so bad. They said, oh, I got good news. I said, all right, give me the good news. I like good news. Good news, man, good news makes me feel good. It makes me smile, makes me laugh. Man, this is great, wonderful. But what about the greatest news? You know, that's what the gospel means is the good news. The good news. The, the, the message. The news. Headline. Headlines. What, what do they say? Uh, papers. Papers. Read all about it. Read all about it. Hey, folks, read all about it. Hey. Folks, you can't go around and tell people the greatest news and share it with them, and they accept that greatest news, and you walk away unfazed by it. It produces joy. You say, man, I, I, I don't know that I could ever talk to somebody. I don't know how to do that. I don't know. Ask God, dear God, would you let my path cross the path of somebody who needs me? Would you let my path cross the, some, the path of somebody who wants to be saved that I can reach? Because soul winning produces joy. Joy. Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you've given us. Uh, Heavenly Father, I'm glad that and thankful that you still save souls, that you're still willing to save people in this wicked, crooked, perverse nation that you still save because the Bible teaches that you can wash away all sin. There is no sin so great that the blood of Jesus can't wash it away. Oh, Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help us to be a light that shines in the darkness. Help us to be salt that gives flavor to a, to a, a, a fake world, a world full of preservatives and additives. And Lord, the world needs the real thing, but the world doesn't like the taste of it. I like how David said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to be good stewards and good examples. Lord, help us to, to fill up our joy tank by walking with Jesus, talking about Jesus, sharing Jesus with others and seeing people saved. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us as individuals, our homes, and our church. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, just pretend that Miss Jennifer is playing, okay? We can all hear it, right? All right, yeah. <laughs>